and my Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, I'm my name is William Jackie, and I'm the academic coordinator at Strive to Learn. Um, we're very excited and we're very fortunate to have a special guest today uh, to talk about special education law. Uh, her name is Janie Brunson, and she works for the Elder Law and Disability Rights Center. And she's going to go over, she's going to give a presentation today and go over everything you would need to know basically in. Uh, in within an hour, that is uh, everything you would need to know about special education law, um, how students in education are protected under the law, um, what the provisions are, um, what families can do to seek accommodations and seek services, um, and more. So uh, we're really happy to have her. Really, really fortunate. And um, you know, so first of all, just want to introduce you, Janie. Um, can you just tell us briefly um, a little bit about your background and your work with the Elder Law and Disability Rights Center? Yeah, so my name is Janie Brunson. Um, I just graduated last year from UC Irvine Law School with my law degree. Um, and now I am doing a fellowship with the Elder Law and Disability Rights Center. We're a legal nonprofit in Santa Ana. Um, we do help a lot of low income individuals. Um, and my job is to start this special education program so that we can um, be extending our services in the area of special education law to the families in Orange County who need them and would benefit from them. So. Great, well, again, we're, we're really glad to have you. Thank you so much for joining. And um, I'll just go ahead and say, take it away. Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, well, first I'll also say that I have a personal connection to special education. Um, I was born blind and my poor mother went through so much difficulties and drama to get me the materials I needed and the services and the education so that I was able to go through college and law school and um, end up where I am today. So. I'm so grateful. I have wonderful parents. Um, I had parents who, you know, did, did give up and figured out the system for my sake. Um, so I would love to help other people do that and other families do that so that they don't have to go through all the ridiculous that all the ridiculousness that my family went through. Um, so to begin with, let's just talk about the law that governs special education and all related services. Um, so it has its own law. It's called the Ind Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The fun acronym for that is IDEA. Um, and it basically explains what special education is and who is eligible for it. So federal law requires that the school district needs to provide services to meet the unique educational needs of a disabled child, and that's at no cost to the parent. So who's eligible for this, right? So any child whose performance in school is affected by one of these 13 disabilities, right? These eligibility criteria, um, and they're all on the slide there, but just in general, there's a, they're pretty, they cover a lot of things, right? They're very broad. So you have specific learning disability, autism, emotional disturbance, that can be any kind of mental health issues like trauma, PTSD, um, depression, any mental health issues that are affecting a child's performance in school. Of course, speech and language impairment, visual impairment, hearing impairment, um, intellectual disability. And then there's this other health impairment, which is kind of a broad catch-all thing. Um, a lot of times ADHD or ADD will fall into that category. So kids who just have ADHD are um, or can be eligible for special education. So in the idea, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, the important things to know are these two concepts. The first one is the free and appropriate public education. So that's FAPE, F-A-P-E. There's so many acronyms in special ed, so it's hard to keep track of them all. But yeah, free and appropriate public education is FAPE. And that basically means that the child will get services based on their unique needs so that they can reach 
educational goals. And of, of course, the free part means that it should all be free. Parents should not have to pay for these services. So that's FAPE. The second important concept is the least restrictive environment, LRE. And that means that a child will be educated with non-disabled students as much as possible. So if they're able to, they should be in a mainstream classroom with all other children doing normal things, unless their disability just makes that impossible. And even so, they can still be in a school with other children doing what the other children are doing, or they can have certain times of the day when they're not um, kind of segregated in their disability class. Um, so just the continuum of the restrictive environments, right? The first one would be that general education classroom. All the children are non-disabled. Um, a child with a disability could do well and fit in there. Um, if necessary, they can be in a special day class, which is kind of a special classroom in a regular school, right? But um, kids with disabilities might be in there for various reasons. Um, or a child could be in a special private school or the most restrictive thing is a residential treatment center. Um, that's very restrictive for kids who have pretty severe disabilities. They um, almost live there full time basically and get the services and the attention that they need. But the point is a child should not be put in an environment that is more restrictive than his disability requires. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. so. Special education, great. Um, how do we start the process of getting a child these free services and everything they need? The first step is an assessment. So if you feel that a child has a disability of any kind that is affecting that kid's performance in school, you should definitely request an assessment. The way to request the assessment is that the request needs to be in writing and it needs to be given to a school administrator. Um, a good example of that is the principal um, or the director of special ed or whatever, but yeah, often the principal is a good, good go-to there. Um, so in writing, given to the school administrator, that's all that you need. And anytime you make a request like this, you should also get documentation that the request was, was received. That could be like a confirmation email, uh, something with a timestamp on it. Um, that's just always a good thing to do in case this becomes an issue later. You can say, I did request this and you didn't comply with the request, um, just so you have proof of that. Hopefully it doesn't become an issue, but if it does. Um, okay, so you're requesting an assessment. An assessment will be done by a qualified professional who will decide if your child is eligible for special education. So um, if the child has a mental or psychological disability, that might be a psychologist doing that assessment and deciding that your child is eligible. If it has a, if the child has a vision problem like myself, they might be a, um, you know, ophthalmologist, whoever the qualified professional is. Um, going off of that, now we go to types of assessments, right? So there's a tons of assessments that you could request. Um, you could request basically any kind of assessment that you think would help identify the child's disability. Um, just a, not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but some of them include a functional behavioral assessment. That's for a kid who has behavioral problems, um, a social emotional assessment, um, a vision or hearing assessment, of course, an academic assessment if the child has a learning disabilities, um, all kinds of assessments that, that could be done to determine what the child's disability is, how severe it is, and whether the child is eligible for special education. Um, the next thing about assessments is the timelines. So after you submit that request, remember in writing submitted to the school administrator, the district needs to send you as the parent, I should say, needs to send the parent an assessment plan within 15 school days. So that plan will explain who will do the assessment, when it will happen, what it will look like, all the details about that within 15 school days. 
And then the parent must approve the assessment plan before the district can move forward with the assessment. So you need to look that over, say, yes, I think that this is a good thing for my child, sign that and um, basically consent for that assessment to happen. Um, after the parent approves the assessment plan, the assessment must happen. And if your child is found eligible, an IEP meeting must be scheduled within 60 school days. And remember, like I was saying, that's why it's important to keep a record of when you sent that request, when you approve the assessment plan and all that, because if 60 days have passed since you approved that plan and the assessment has not happened yet, and an IEP meeting has not been scheduled or a, at least a determination of eligibility has not been made, then that's a major problem, right? You might want to call an advocate or an attorney like me to help you figure out what to do next because that means the school district is not complying. So they have 15 days to give you that assessment plan. And after that, 60 days to do that assessment, decide if the child is eligible and go ahead and schedule that IEP meeting. Um, one more thing on assessments is the independent educational evaluation. So say you do the assessment and they say, we don't think the child is eligible. The child's disability is not a big enough deal or it doesn't affect his performance in school or whatever ridiculous reason they come up with. And you say, that's ridiculous. I think the child should be eligible and should be getting services. You can request an independent educational evaluation. So that would be another assessment, which is done by an independent professional, probably someone that you would choose and not someone that the school would choose, right? So if the school psychologist did your child's assessment and said, yeah, kid's not eligible, but then you think they're biased, right? Because they work for the school. Um, you could have an independent psychologist do that and either confirm that the child is not eligible or disagree and say, yes, this child should be getting special education services. Um, the school district does have to pay for one independent educational evaluation and they do have to consider its results. So um, they might not wanna do that, but that's what the law says they have to do. Okay, so hopefully we've done the assessment. The child was hopefully determined to be eligible for special education service. So then the next step would be the IEP meeting. Um, an IEP, by the way, stands for Individualized Education Plan. I told you there's tons of acronyms. So you're gonna have an IEP meeting. The meeting should be held every year or any time upon your request. So at least annually, you should be having an IEP about your child who is in special education. But you can also request that IEP on any, any time. And again, to request an IEP meeting at any time, the request just needs to be in writing and submitted to a school administrator. And once you make that request, the meeting should be held within 30 days. Again, if you make the request and it's not held within 30 days, that's a problem call a legal advocate or an attorney who might be able to help you with that. Um, so in terms of scheduling this IEP meeting, the district should give you notice of the meeting and the notice should be in your primary language and they must do their best to arrange a time when you are able to attend. So if they say, yeah, we have to have the IEP meeting for your child during your work hours, too bad, so sad, I guess you can't be there. Um, thank you. They can't do that. They need to do their best to make sure that you as the parent can attend because the parent is a major part of the IEP team. Um, so moving on to who should be present at the meeting. Obviously the parent, most important thing. Um, then at least one general education teacher and at least one special education teacher or service provider. So both of those people, and then a district representative should be present. And um, ideally the individual who conducted the assessment, um, especially if it's the first meeting after the assessment, 
you want the person who conducted the assessment there to explain, um, you know, recommendations, why the child is eligible and all that. Um, and then if necessary, an interpreter should be there if the parent needs that. Um, and then also if appropriate, the student should be there. Um, if the child is old enough to understand what's going on and wants to be there and participate in his own life decisions, basically, um, there's no reason why he should not be at his own IEP. Um, and then of course, anyone else that the parent wants to be present. Um, the parent has a lot of power in this situation. I know that the school district makes it feel completely otherwise, but they do. So if you as a parent want, you know, your best friend there for moral support, the child's babysitter, whoever you want can be at, at that IEP meeting. Um, also, you can record the IEP meeting if you want to. Um, and that's also just a good record to have in case issues come up later. Um, but if you want to do that, you must give the district 24 hours notice that you're going to record it. Okay, so what's in this IEP? What's this meeting all about? Elements of the IEP. So your meeting should result in a written document which contains the plan for your child's education that school year. Plan should be very detailed. So um, it should contain the present levels of performance that's how the child is doing in school right now. And then measurable educational goals that are appropriate. So it can't just be, I want the kid to get better in reading. It has to be the more detailed, the better, right? So instead of just let's improve his reading, maybe he needs to be reading um, full sentences by the end of the year, or he needs to be able to write coherent paragraphs by the end of the year, or he needs to be able to read a certain book. Um, I don't know if these are good examples, but point is they have to be as detailed and measurable as possible so that you can make sure the child actually is making progress and reaching those goals. Um, and then we need a specific description of the services that will be provided, including the frequency and duration. So again, um, it can't just say the child will get speech therapy. It has to say, speech therapy for this amount of time, this often. So for two hours a week or for five hours a month on Tuesdays and Thursdays or um, things like that, right? As specific as possible. And then finally, of course, placement in the least restrictive environment. We talked about that, making sure that the child is in an appropriate classroom and isn't being kind of restricted or kept away from other children if that's not absolutely necessary. Um, so what services are available for the child to have? Um, this is good to know because a lot of parents don't know exactly what they can request or what's available to help their child. So basically the short answer is there's a ton of services, right? Um, as a parent, you can feel free to request anything that you think would benefit your child. But just as a jumping off point, some of the services include speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, a child can have a one-on-one -on -one aid in the classroom, if that's necessary, can have extra tutoring. Um, and then any assistive technology also that's necessary for your child's educational success. Um, some of that can be expensive. It doesn't matter if it is necessary for your child's success, you should definitely request it. And if you can make a good argument for that, the district should hopefully agree to provide that. Um, so then after all that is written out in the IEP document, the district will ask you to sign the IEP. People say, well, do I have to sign the IEP? The answer is no, of course not. As the parent, um, you have final approval on that IEP and whether it is implemented or not. So if you don't agree with the IEP, you don't have to sign it. Um, you as the parent are entitled to a copy of the IEP to take home and review. Um, you can have the copy, look at it, ask, 
your friends about it. Take as long as you want to consider whether this is the best thing for your child and whether to sign it and agree to it. And then here's a fun thing. You can agree with the whole IEP or you can choose to agree with only parts of it. So you can say, I like these services, but I don't like this other part of the IEP. I don't want my child getting that. Um, you can just agree with it in part and only the parts that you agree with will be implemented. Um, and an important note here is this idea of stay put. So if you disagree with the IEP, you refuse to sign it, um, people say, well, does that mean the child doesn't get an IEP at all? Um, no, because the last IEP that you agreed with will remain in place. So if you choose, you hate this year's IEP and you're, you don't want it to happen, um, the child will just continue getting everything under last year's IEP. So that's stay put, that's an important thing when you're considering whether to agree with the IEP or not. Um, an important note about discipline and special education. Um, this can be important for students with behavioral problems. Um, people who tend to act out in school. Um, so what if a student is causing trouble and the district wants to suspend or expel that student? Um, if the student is in special education, there must be this meeting called a manifestation determination meeting. Um, that should be held 10 days after the incident to determine whether the behavior at issue was because of the child's disability. And if it was, the IEP team should come up with a plan so that this can be addressed or prevented in the future. So instead of disciplining the student, just expelling him or whatever, um, the district needs to have this meeting with the IEP team, decide was this directly because of the child's disability and was it because we were not giving the child the appropriate services, right? So if it was a major behavior problem, um, they could at this meeting maybe come up with a behavioral intervention plan, which is a detailed plan to address these issues moving forward um, and hopefully make sure that this is no longer a problem. Um, and obviously that's a better solution than just expelling or suspending a child because they have disability related issues. So that's a good protection in terms of discipline for a child who uh, is in special education. And then I'll talk a little bit about 504 plans because um, it's a common thing that comes up if after an assessment, the school decides the child is not eligible for special education, they might offer a 504 plan instead of an IEP. So what is 504? Um, it's a plan that's based on section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So that's a civil rights law that's completely outside of the idea of the special education thing, right? So completely different law. Um, but it does apply to anyone with a disability, even if that person does not fall under the categories that make him eligible for special education. So it covers any, anyone with a disability, regardless of all the eligibility categories we talked about at the beginning for IDEA. Um, the purpose of the 504 plan is to provide certain accommodations which remove barriers so that the disabled student can access general education. So um, this is kind of a weird thing, it's hard to understand, but the main difference between the IEP and the 504 is that an IEP provides specialized instruction or special services, right? That a um, child who was not in special education would not be receiving. So if a child is say deaf and needs to learn sign language, that's a specialized instruction that's to do with, with the, that child's disability. So that would be special education. 504 plan, however, does not do that. It just kind of um, allows for accommodations or removes barriers, right? So um, an accommodation might be extra time on tests or sitting in the front row 
so you can see the chalkboard better. Um, those are nice things to have, but they are not necessarily specialized instruction or special services. They're just kind of simple accommodations to do with a child's disability, if that makes sense. Um, what does the 504 plan include? It's much less specific than the IEP, basically. It just needs to be a team of people who are familiar with the child and who understand you know, what the child needs. Um, it oftentimes is written, but there's no rule that says it has to be a written document. Um, it usually contains what accommodations and services will be provided for the child, um, but it doesn't have nearly the level of detail that an IEP legally has to contain. All right. Um, so I guess the thing with 504 plans is if you feel that a child would benefit or would do well with just a few changes to the environment, um, they're really good for that. But if the child needs anything at all extra in terms of services, education, um, definitely push for the IEP and the special education. It's a lot more comprehensive. Okay, so now we get into what happens if the district does not comply with the law, right? Like I said, if they're not following these um, procedures in terms of timelines, if they're not um, implementing the IEP in the way that they said they would, um, there's a few different things that can happen. The first one is a compliance complaint. So that happens when the district is not following those procedures. Or like I said, the student's IP is not being implemented. So that is um, something that anyone can file, technically. Anybody can file a compliance complaint and say the district should have done this and they didn't do it. Um, but that being said, you may want an attorney or at least a legal advocate to help you write that up so that all the important points are covered and all the relevant law is in there and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and those are filed with the, the California Department of Education. So district doesn't respond to your IEP request within 30 days, file the compliance complaint with the California Department of Education. District is not providing a service that they should be providing under the IEP, compliance complaint, California Department of Education. Um, they will come out and investigate the situation, do their own searching around. And um, if they determine that the district is at fault, they will order them to get back in line, basically. That's a strike on their record. Um, the other thing that's available to families is to file for a due process. So a family would request a due process hearing when the family in the district cannot agree on services or placement. So it's not just a procedural thing like, oh, they didn't follow the timeline or they didn't do what they said they would do. It's a real disagreement over whether the child needs a, for example, needs an IEP at all or if the child just needs a 504 plan, or if um, the district wants to place your child in a special class or a special school and you really don't think that that's necessary and you guys just cannot agree on, on any of it, right? So then you would file a for a due process hearing and that's with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, technically, parents could do this themselves, but again, especially for this, right? It's best to have an attorney with you, helping you with this um, because it is like going to court. Basically, that's what it is. It's a formal mediation proceeding. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot of documents exchanged and it's kind of a whole process, right? So it's best to have someone who's familiar with all that on your side, kind of guiding you through it because it is stressful to begin with. 
So those are the two things that you can do. Um, compliance complaint if there are kind of procedural issues or if there's a real substantive issue where you and the district do not agree, you can do the due process hearing. Um, and then at the end here, I have a little discussion of, of um, distance learning. That was such a huge deal over the past year. Um, luckily, with vaccines and everything, hopefully the pandemic is just about over and I know schools have kind of started reopening. Um, but just so you're aware, right? In California, in June 2020, there was a, a law that was that was signed about um, distance learning. And it said that every IEP must now contain a distance learning plan. So from here on out, the IEP must contain um, kind of a plan for how the student's IEP will be implemented in a distance learning setting. So obviously this was because of the pandemic, but it now kind of applies to any emergency, right? So any emergency that will keep a child from school for any important period of time will not allow them to attend school. There needs to be a plan for that and how that disabled child will continue getting the accommodations and services that they need despite not being actually in the school environment and still continue with their education. Um, and obviously that should be with as little disruption as possible to the child's education. It's all about continuity, right? Um, if you have a child who is in special education and they have not had this be part of their IEP, um, it's definitely something to request. You can request an IEP meeting and say, I need us to come up with a distance learning plan, either because this is currently not working or because it will not work in the future if the child has to go back to distance learning and does not have a plan in place for how they're going to access all that. Um, so that should be part of every IEP from here on out. So if it's not, be proactive in that way. Um, the other important thing is um, each school district for the 2021 school year was required to come up with this learning continuity and attendance plan, this LCAP. So they had to prepare a detailed plan of how they would implement distance learning for the duration of the pandemic and the school year. And that includes how the educational needs of disabled students would be met. So um, I don't know how well they did with that, but it's important to note that they were required to come up with that detailed plan and lay it all out there before this school year even started. Um, and then an important thing about IEPs and assessments in the time of COVID, um, I know at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of districts were saying, well, we can't do IEPs, we can't do assessments because we're doing everything remotely. So, you know, if your child needs that, too bad. Um, now, legally, that's not an excuse to stop doing assessments. Um, if appropriate, it is definitely possible to conduct certain assessments remotely. Um, and even if everyone is agreeable and there's a, the adherence to all the health guidelines, um, assessments can still be conducted in person, of course. Um, you can always, as a parent, negotiate with the district for more time if they say we need more than the 15 days or the 16 day, 60 days to come up with an assessment plan or to do the assessment. Um, you can agree that that's okay, but um, legally there's nothing that says that they get more time for that stuff because of the pandemic. And of course, IEP meetings can always be conducted virtually um, through Zoom like we're doing right now. So there's really no good reason why they should not um, have an annual IEP during the pandemic. Um, that is my spiel. I hope that that was helpful. Um, the last slide here is just with my contact info. So please, if you have 
any questions about any of this, give me a call, send me an email. Um, right now we're providing free services in this area, special education law, um, as we get this program started. So it's free, there's nothing to lose. If you wanna give me a call or just ask me questions about, about any of this or about your specific case, um, please let me know and thanks for listening. Okay, um, thank you so much, Janie. That was extremely informative and um, you know all very relevant. Um, <clears throat> so I do have some follow-up questions um, I'd like to ask, and I, I appreciate you being available to answer some questions. Um, yeah, and we could just go ahead and leave that that slide up. I think uh, we'll just leave Janie's contact information up there. Um, so you know, first of all, I kind of just wanted to ask when I was in the beginning when you were talking about um, your experience growing up and kind of what school was like for you and sort of the element of, um, you know, how your mom had to, how, you know, it sounded like you were, you were implying that it was challenging for your mom to yeah. make well, yeah. your education more accessible to you and, you know, get accommodations for you. Um, so, not, you know, without uh, uh, not asking you to go into a lot of detail in that, and, unless you would like to, but how, how have you observed that? I mean, the law itself might not have changed because, you know, the, the laws that, that you're talking about, IDEA and Section 504, these laws have been around for, you know, decades now at this point, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the law may not have changed, or maybe just in minor ways it has, but how has the actual implementation of the laws changed? Have you noticed anything becoming easier for parents and for students? over time? Um, I don't know if I can speak too much to that because I just started doing this work like, you know, this year. Right. Um, however, I think in, yeah, in some ways it has become easier um, just as, as yeah, times change, right? I know when I was young, there was a classroom for all the blind children and it was kind of required that anybody who was blind goes into this classroom and does, you know, hangs out there and is yeah. separated from all the other kids, um, which was something my mom was very against. Um, right. And I don't think that's a thing anymore. Um, there are special day classes, but not in terms of let's just put everybody with the same disability together in one place. I think yeah. people have, um, maybe not completely, but in a lot of ways realize that that's not a good system. Um, so, I mean, definitely some things like that have improved, um, but yeah, it's still not, of course, it's st still not great, right? Um, it's hard for parents to, Get the district to agree to teach um just speaking from my experience to teach a blind student braille for example um uh -huh. they'll they like to say oh you don't need braille because there's audiobooks or um that's just an example but you know you don't need this service because it's not really important um and parents just really? need to argue on behalf of you know it is important to be able to read or it is important that my child gets these services, even if you think maybe technically they could survive without it, that's not the point, right? Right, right. So yeah, I think definitely things have improved, but there's still a lot of challenges, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of speaking from, um, you know, the point of view of the, the teacher, um, something that, that comes to mind when you were talking about that is, um, and as far as special day classes, and like the idea of, uh, being put in a classroom with, uh, you know, the other blind students and everyone kind of being grouped together. Um, you know, I, a little background, um, a little of my background is I um, went back to school to back to college to get my teaching credential, um, you know, several years ago. And so this was the early, earlier in the decade, it was or the, earlier in the 2010s, I guess, since we're not in that decade anymore, um, <laughs> that takes an adjustment. But what one of the things that I was taught in my teaching credential program um, was that 
there seemingly has been somewhat of an evolution over time, or at least the emphasis has changed a little bit. And I think that that maybe goes along with um, universal changes in education, or at least kind of philosophy of or approach to education. But one of those things that was really emphasized, I remember, um, was inclusion and uh, immersion. Um, you know, both words that uh, that came up a lot. And as far as the idea that students with disabilities should not be um, separated and segregated, yeah. but should be allowed to be part of, you know, their peer group, basically, um, and that that is the best way to um, to learn. You know, that's the best way for that student to learn. And it's also it also benefits the other students to to have students who have disabilities present. Um, yeah. So just, you know, basically better for everyone. Um, so yeah, I, you know, that, 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 that comes to mind. That's at least something that I feel like there is the intention. Um, and I know that a lot of the, the, the implementation has changed too. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I, I know there are still um, obstacles and there are still challenges that, that students face and that parents face, um, you know, trying to get the right support services. So, um, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, and some kind of more detail questions based on some some things in that you mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, because so I'm I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a legal education. Most of what I know about the law is either from reading novels or from watching legal shows, which you know I do quite often because I, I yeah. enjoy legal shows. <laughs> Who doesn't? But yeah, I, I really don't know the law. But something that I get a strong impression of with the law is that that words matter and the way that a word is interpreted can, can really change, um, you know, the way that a law is implemented. So I'm curious about some of the wording, um, the idea of no cost to the parent. Um, that's a phrase that's intriguing to me because I hear from, from families that we work with sometimes that they had to pay, you know, hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars to get an assessment um, for a high school student or, you know, even for younger age students. What you did mention at one point that um, the the district has to cover um, one independent evaluation. Yeah. Are, when would a parent have to actually pay for any of the costs associated with a, their child receiving services? Um, Are there any other instances other than with an independent evaluator? None of them come to mind. I mean, if a parent wants a special service that the district can't offer, um, well, here's what I guess if they want to their child to go to private school, right? Um, they probably, of course, have to pay the private school tuition, but they also might have to pay for certain services, which the private school doesn't have available on their campus. Um, which might be available, you know, more freely at a public school, but since they're choosing not to go the public school route, um, they might have to pay for those kinds of things. Um, that's, yeah, that's the best thing that I can think of. But yeah, as much as possible, the district is supposed to provide whatever services the child needs to reach the educational goals okay. at no cost. Yeah, so I think probably in the instances that I'm thinking of, it, it was probably not the first independent evaluation. Um, yeah, you can pay for as many independent evaluations as you want. Right. Uh, okay. But yeah, um, and I think a lot of districts don't even, people don't know that rule, right? That the district mm, should pay for the first one. So right. they just won't do it, which is, you know, not okay. But now we know there's a rule that says they actually yeah. should be doing that. Well, now that you mentioned that, you know, I'm curious if if that actually is what happened. So, so basically, you're saying sometimes they they just won't do it, and the family is none the wiser. They just don't know that that they didn't have to pay for that evaluation. Yeah, I mean, who is going to look up this obscure rule, right? Especially mm. if a parent is working several jobs, if it's English is their second language, if um, they have you know six kids and one of them has a disability, um, any of those things. Right. Now, if, okay, so if, one more question about this, if uh, if a family did find out about 
that law and um, or about that protection under the law. And they were in the position where they had been forced to pay or they just the district had not informed them they did not need to pay and never communicated about that or reimbursed them. Would they have rights under the law to pursue um, you know, compensation for that? Yes. Um, probably start with filing a due process, like I was talking about the administrative office of hearings and see if you could get that taken care of through mediation. Um, but if not, they might just have to go to regular civil court and right. uh, file a lawsuit. Right. Um, I also wanted to ask about, so in the, the phrase free and appropriate education, uh, FAPE, mm -hmm. um, that word appropriate, uh, is, there, is there flexibility in how that is interpreted? Is, does, uh, to your knowledge, and I know you said that, you know, that you're um, um, relatively new to this as, as a profession, but to your knowledge, is, that, is there any, ever any friction that comes up with how that word appropriate is interpreted? Oh yeah, a lot. Um, so it used to be that it just meant a child had to be making pretty much minimal progress in school. So any progress was progress and, you know, they were learning a little bit. So that was appropriate. Um, a new case just came out a couple of years ago that says they have to make, you know, meaningful progress based on, you know, several factors related to their disability, um, their potential. Um, so that has changed in the last few years to be a, a higher standard. Um, but yeah, it does not mean that the child has to ha have everything they need to become a astronaut or astrophysicist or, right. you know, reach their ultimate grand potential. Um, but they do need to be yeah. making meaningful progress for them. Yes. Right. Okay. Um... Okay, let's see. I have a lot of questions and uh, we won't have time to get through all of them in 10 minutes. So I have to kind of pick uh, the best ones. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but I'm, I'm kind of curious about what happens when things don't go right. So for example, you mentioned that the assessment plan has to be sent after receiving a request from a, a family. The, re, the assessment plan has to be sent within 15 school days, and then there has to be an assessment within 60 days. And you said if that doesn't happen, you know, that's a problem. Um, what, what would you, what's the next step for a parent if, or, you know, for a family, uh, a guardian, if that situation occurred? So for that situation, it would be the compliance complaint, right? Okay. So as I said, they could write up the compliance complaint themselves, and just file it with the California Department of Education. There's samples online of how to do that. Um, or they could call me or another attorney or legal advocate to help them write up that compliance complaint, get the Department of Ed involved to investigate and basically tell the district that they should be doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then the, this might be the same answer or a similar answer, but there's a particular case that comes to mind where um, a student who, um, received tutoring from us for a while um, was had tried to my knowledge he had tried multiple times and his family had tried to receive services but the school district was pushing back and was not being helpful um, mm -hmm. uh, would it basically be the same thing that the best thing to do would be make a compliance complaint and seek out legal help or is there anything any steps to take before that um, an independent evaluation before that maybe? What would you say to do first if the school is just not really helping and pushing back? Um, yeah, if they did the assessment and they're just, the school is just refusing to admit that the child is eligible, um, an independent evaluation obviously is a good thing to do. Um, but that point it would be due process, right? Because it's not just a procedural issue where they're not responding in 15 days or whatever. It's a uh, major disagreement about what the child needs and what should be what should be happening. So um, if the assessment doesn't work, if there's an independent evaluation and that doesn't work, um, then it would be, yeah, seeking out legal help and filing for due process to resolve the dispute. Okay, and um, I, you know, I had a question again about wording uh, that comes up a lot, but 
um, the word consider. So you were talking about how when uh, an independent evaluator does perform yeah. an evaluation for a student, the one of the stipulations under the law is that school officials have to consider the independent evaluation. Is there are there any guidelines to that, or is that really loosely interpreted? What they actually have to do? Um, I haven't how researched it a ton, but I think it's pretty loose. I don't okay. think that there's definitely no rule that says they have to accept the results or do exactly as the result says. Okay. Um, yeah. They have to consider it as a factor, but yeah, that's not very helpful. And a lot of times they, you know decide not to consider it and it doesn't really solve the problem. So it's unfortunate. And for the sake of those like me who are just almost completely ignorant about how the whole legal process works when it does get to, to complaints, who, mm -hmm. who is making those judgments? Does this go before a judge? I'm assuming it's not necessarily a jury. Uh, these are not jury trials. These are more like um, civil cases. Yeah, so it's, it's what's called administrative hearings. So mm -hmm. it's not um, with the usual county courts, civil courts. Um, it's kind of a separate system mm -hmm. um, and there's hearing officers and their job is to just do all the special education due process hearings um, and decide those. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. And then if that system is completely failing for whatever reason, um, you might go into the regular civil court system. Awesome. Um, okay, I have a kind of a few quick short questions about IEP meetings, um, just yeah. some of, of some of the details. Um, and I, so I've attended some IEP meetings as a teacher um, from, from that side of it. And so, you know, in some ways that that's kind of informing my, my thinking. But um, so you mentioned in some cases, one of the, among the individuals who should be and must be present at an IEP meeting. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned that a student can be present and that it makes a lot of sense for the student to be present, you know, basically to, uh, to be an advocate for themselves uh, among other reasons. But like, what, in what cases do you think it maybe wouldn't make sense for a student to be present? What would a, a situation be where it's not good or you would recommend not having a student present? Um, if the student doesn't understand what this is all about or um, even just does not, want to be there or would be um yeah I mean it's scary right to have all the adults in your life <laughs> kind of sitting around a table talking yeah. about you and mm -hmm. what should be done with you and how intelligent you are and <laughs> what yeah. you've been doing yeah. every day of course. um yeah. so that can stress a lot of kids out um even you know kids who are fairly good and level and, and old enough and all that um so that's just an important thing to consider um, in terms of that. But yeah, other than that, it's just the understanding of um, if they know and can participate in what this IEP is and what it means for them and if they're interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a couple other things in regards to who can be present. Um, can Now, I, I think I know the answer to this because you mentioned that parents can request uh, individuals to be present. Can a tutor be present if, this, if the student typically receives tutoring? Yeah, sure. Just has Anyone that the parent wants. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and then um, this one I'm not so sure about. Could, can a specific teacher be requested to be present? Now, there needs to be generally at least one special education teacher and at least one general education teacher, right? But can parents request a specific teacher to be present or require a specific teacher? Um, I don't see why not. Um, the parent can, you know, going back to they can have whoever they want. Um, a teacher does have to be present. So if that teacher is agreeable and wants to be the teacher, then that's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess if it was a question of, do we move the IEP forward or just never have the meeting because this one person isn't present, um, you know, you'd have to worry about that. The parent might have to consider whether that's worth it, but um, yeah, there's no reason why the parent can't request a specific teacher. And I think the biggest takeaway from, from those questions and from what you said earlier during your presentation is that parents, you know, to make sure parents realize you do have a lot of rights and contrary to how the situation might be presented by the school. Um, now it's not, I don't mean to always shade it negatively, but sometimes it is probably presented in, in a negative way um, yeah. to some families, but parents, you do have 
strong protection under the law, you do have the right to um, have individual individuals present you would like. You have the right to ask certain teachers to be there. Um, you know, because the idea, is, the focus is the student. It's it's all about the student, and the idea is to help that student. And so, you know, whoever you feel should be present, whoever can be helpful in that situation, you have the right to to try to make the meeting uh, as effective as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, so we're almost wrapping up. I want to fit in just a couple more uh, quick questions. Thank you so much mm -hmm. again for for your time. Um, so this is a little, this is less of a legal question and a little more of kind of maybe a philosophy of education, but um, I'm curious for parents of, of younger children who suspect that their child might have a disability, um, would, do you think it would be better to seek out assessment early uh, when they're young still, you know, still in elementary grades or maybe even earlier, or is it best to kind of wait and let the child develop? Um. Yeah, it's a matter of opinion, right? But I would say off the top of my head, definitely request it early. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? The worst thing is that somebody says the child does not have a disability or doesn't have a disability that makes him eligible for special education, um, but it might benefit from a 504 plan or um, you might want to get the child just into some private tutoring or, or I mean... I think if you think there's a problem, something should be done about it. Um, ignoring it, waiting for it to either get worse or resolve itself, um, it just kind of puts the situation out of your control. And um, a child is a like a sponge, right? I mean, you want to get on these things early so that right. they're done. Yeah. And it's not a problem later for the kid as they're growing up. Yeah, and right. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And for the record, I agree. Um, I feel the same way. I think that it, it you know, it makes the most sense to uh, not to wait. There's no reason to do that. Um, you know, this is another one of those things that from the teacher's perspective, something that we were taught is early, early intervention uh, is very effective. And, um, you know, studies have shown that it works really well to start having children receive services earlier. Um, it just sets them up for success well later on, you know, because you you develop habits and you develop um, your self-esteem and your idea of yourself at a young age and it develops over time. And if there's anything you can do to help, um, you know, a, a child or a, a, a student in their development, it's best to, to do that earlier rather than to wait. I, I absolutely agree. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so this question is actually kind of a, um, uh, selfish one, but I think it also might, per, you know, might be helpful to anyone who's watching um, now or later. Um, I am the parent of a of a young child, um, a three year old who has had uh, who's been behind on speech, um, and I've been informed that um, at age three, so she's three now. I was told this when she was still two, that she would be potentially eligible for services from a school district. Um, do you know what the what the age or the kind of the boundaries are of when the, you, children are supported under these laws? Yes, and that's a good question. I can't believe I didn't put that in my presentation already, um, but I will add it. So it is three, three, three. Okay. Uh, three years old until the child either graduates from high school and gets that diploma or until the child is like 22 years old mm -hmm. if they never end up graduating. So huge range, um, but yeah, it starts at three. Um, you can, that's when you can start having an IEP and going through the assessment process and all that. Okay. And then um, I'll just wrap up with one last question. Um, it's 6.01 right now, so I need to let you go, but I have one final question and I don't think yeah. it'll take too long. But um, so at the very end of your presentation, you, you touched on some of the updates uh, post COVID and you know in relation to distance learning. And I thought it was really interesting. I was not aware of this, but I thought it was really interesting that there's a requirement for every IEP to uh, cover a distance learning plan. Um, I'm curious though, um, and now this might be speculation or it may be covered under the law, but is this something that is going to continue when schools are fully in person again as like kind of a precaution um, against you know, future school closures? It, are, is that going to continue to be part of uh, IEPs to your knowledge? That's the idea, yes. Okay. Because this was all crazy. Suddenly people couldn't go to school and then 
we didn't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if anything like this or remotely like this ever happens again, everybody wants to have a plan in place. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Janie. It's been extremely informative and uh, there was so much you covered in your presentation that it was hard for me to come up with questions, <laughs> but I'm glad to hear that, that we were able to cover something that, that you'll be including in the future too. But, um, but yeah, thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate you, you joining us. Is there anything, uh, any last things you'd like to mention? No, just thank you very much. And um, you can refer people to me or people can contact me and, um answer their questions and help them with their special ed stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And to anyone watching, uh, stay tuned. We'll have more Strive to Learn webinars coming up very soon. And we appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much. Thanks.